We all know the story by now. Some fella named Satoshi Nakamoto sent an email to a cryptography mailing list on Halloween 2008. The email read, I have been working on an electronic cash system that's fully peer-to-peer. -peer. Here is a link to the paper. Here is the main properties. Here is the title of the paper. And here is a copy of the abstract of the paper. Oh, and did I mention, here's a link to the paper. My name is definitely Satoshi Nakamoto. Before we get into the white paper, let me give you a brief outline of each section. The first section is titled The Introduction, and this is pretty self-explanatory. He introduces the paper. Section 2 is called Transactions, and in this section, we define what an electronic coin is and how exactly we go about transferring it from one person to the other. Section 3 is entitled Timestamp Server, and this is basically a centralized blockchain. And this technology has been around since the 1990s, but this hasn't really been applied at all to digital money or electronic money or cryptocurrencies or whatever you want to call it until Satoshi did so in this white paper. Section 4 is entitled Proof of Work, and we use proof of work to extend the centralized blockchain into a decentralized blockchain. Section 5 brings sections 2, 3 and 4 together and tells you exactly how the network operates. How do we talk to nodes? What do you do when you receive a transaction from a node? How do you validate a transaction? How do you validate a block? And so forth. Section 6 is called incentives and not surprisingly it is all to do with incentivizing people to strengthen the network, to run their own node and to help secure the blockchain. Section 7 should not be overlooked. It is entitled Reclaiming Disk Space, which sounds boring as fuck, but I assure you this is extremely important. It is important because it enables something called simplified payment verification, which is absolutely essential for the long-term sustainability of Bitcoin. Talking of simplified payment verification, that is the name of Section 8, and we'll explain how on earth this works. It basically allows you to run a very lightweight node without much memory and you can run this on your mobile phone or a small coffee shop can run it. And of course, if we want Bitcoin to scale to any substantial size, it is absolutely essential that we allow people to participate in the network by running what we call lightweight nodes. And section nine, at this point, we say to ourselves, hang on, if something costs 20,000 so-called electronic coins, then it's going to be a piss take to send 20,000 transactions over the network. Is there any way we can just say, hey, combine all of my coins, here it is, 20,000 lump sum, enjoy. The answer is, of course, yes, we can do that. And section nine tells us how we go about doing that. Section 10, this is pretty much obsolete. It goes on about privacy and how, oh yes, we're so private because we all have public keys identifying us and not our real names. But as we shall find out, that is no longer the case. Section 11, calculations. This part of the paper is all about an attacker trying to attack the network, which sounds very scary. And that's pretty much it. Section 12 is the shortest section in the history of sections. It just says conclusion. Yep. Here's what I've done. Do you like it? I hope you like it. By liking, commenting and subscribing, what you will do is increase the probability of a brighter future because more people would be better educated at crypto and they won't shit themselves and run away when shit hits the fan. That's enough for now. Let's get into the paper. Yeah, 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 Mr. Banker, please don't take my coins away. We know they won't be where you say. Yeah, I feel lucky because my stomach's full today. And sometimes I don't. Before we get into the paper, we first have to know what a hash function is and what is meant by a digital signature. Some of you already know this, so I'm going to go through this very, very quickly. So a hash function, if you ever see this pink H throughout this video, that means hash function. It takes any input, X, it could be the whole works of Shakespeare, it could be the number zero, it could be the number one, one, zero, 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 one, whatever. The main thing is this, no matter the size, it will accept it and it will spit out a 256-bit number. This function has very, very special properties. 
Any change whatsoever in X will result in an entirely different output and it's impossible to invert. And so we can treat this as a pseudo random function. So why are we gonna use it? Later, as we shall see, what we are going to require is that when we take the hash of something called a block, that the output begins with a certain number of zeros. And so the best thing we can do in this case, because H just spits out random numbers, is a brute force approach, which is going to keep trying numbers over and over and over again until we get the desired output. This will then serve as our proof of work. Hey, look, I have these zeros. That is proof that I've done the work. And if that doesn't make sense, then do not worry. It will make sense in a bit. We will also use hash functions in another way. We're going to be taking the hash of transactions. In this case, we're just going to get whatever it gives us. Transactions are fixed. We're not going to be changing the number here. It will spit out a unique number. Well, basically unique because there is two to the power of 256 different possible outputs, basically unique. And what this number is going to do, it's going to serve as a transaction ID, and we will see how we're gonna use that in section five. Private keys and public keys. Okay, here we go. Anytime you see a red key, think private, only known by one person. Anytime you see a public key, think public, known by everybody. And what we're gonna do is we're going to send a message to the rest of the Bitcoin network Let's call it M for now. And what this M will say is, hello, I have the private key corresponding to this public key and I wish to transfer my coins to somebody else. Here is the proof that it is from me. I will encrypt the message with my private key and everyone else will go, okay, if you really did have access to the private key, then if I get your public key and apply that to this number, then because they are inverses, we should be left with M. And then they're all satisfied. Now these private and public keys are just numbers, but as you've just heard, I've been using uh, terminology such as applying to, which kind of implies that they are functions. And yes, okay, they are numbers, but when you have a private and a public key used in conjunction with a digital signature algorithm, they act as the parameters which implicitly define a function. Don't worry about that. I will make another video on that very soon. And if you wanna see that, of course, you know what to do, subscribe. Just as a side note, it's not mentioned in this paper and you don't need to know, Bitcoin uses something called the Elliptic Curve Digital Signature Algorithm, ECDSA for short, and it uses a particular version called SECP256K1. Okay, let's get into the actual paper. Let's start with the abstract. Bitcoin is described as a system. If you see Bitcoin with a capital B, it refers to the system as a whole, the protocols involved, etc. If you see a lowercase b, that refers to the number go up coin, i.e. the currency. If you want an example of each using a sentence, then here we go. I am learning about capital B itcoin versus I just sent three lowercase b itcoins to my friend. Okay, so the whole point of this paper is that Satoshi is able to solve something called the double spending problem using a peer-to-peer -peer network that going through any third party. In the late 90s and early 2000s, there were a few attempts to solve this. B-Money and BitGold were only theoretical, they never got to the ground. RPOW was implemented by somebody called Hal Finney, who actually received the first ever Bitcoin from Satoshi himself, but his solution was centralized, but, and I'm not going to go into that any further. Basically, they could not solve the double spending problem in a decentralized way. Now, this problem is really, really simple in a centralized banking model that we're all familiar with. Let's say we have two women, Alicia and Karen, and Alicia wishes to send Karen some money. She'll say, hello bank, pay Karen $10,051. They'll check if she has enough, they'll subtract it from her account, and they'll add it to Karen's account. And then Alicia cannot send that money to anybody else because her balance has been updated and she hasn't got it. Now this is trivial in the centralized model, but the question is, how do we prevent somebody from double spending money in a decentralized system? Now, one thing to point out is that Ethereum does use this account model. That is, it has basically names and the balance or public keys and balances. Bitcoin has something called a UTXO or unspent transaction output model. Now this is going to be something different if you're not familiar with Bitcoin at all, but do not worry, we're going to explain all of this very, very soon. The rest of this abstract is repeated in the introduction section, so let's just move on to the first section of the paper. What's worth pointing out here is that Satoshi does not say the central banks have a monopoly on the issuance of fiat currency and we're all enslaved. No, no, no. His approach is not what you would think it is based on the current narrative around Bitcoin being something that offers sovereignty to the individual, offers an escape out of the central banking system or the banking system. Satoshi's focus is actually on that of e-commerce 
commerce on the internet. He says during online transactions, a third party is required to settle disputes when people complain or say, I want a refund. And so this basically stops us from having micro payment systems on the internet, whereby we would pay a small amount of money for something such as watching a YouTube video or reading an article online. Instead, as the number of transactions go up, we have the number of disputes going up and the number of operating costs for these third parties goes up. And so basically all of these third parties think to themselves, hang on, this is not profitable. So a solution is to set a minimum transaction amount. And this leads us down to the advertisement based business models. And there's no need to go into how much shit that comes along with that. And so Satoshi says, we do not need this. We do not have to have this. We can have an electronic payment system based on cryptographic proof instead of trust. And he says, I propose a timestamp server that's going to be a blockchain and I'm going to distribute it, make it decentralized. And we're going to have a singular chronological order of the transactions. And this entire system is going to be secure unless an attacker accumulates more than 50% of the CPU power, in which case we are fucked. Okay, let's now move on to section two of the paper. Section two defines what an electronic coin is and it gives us this pretty diagram here which shows us how the current owner transfers to the next owner. You'll notice that we do not know where owner zero got the coin from. In section six, I'll tell you and spoiler alert, the miners are awarded with coins as a reward for securing a blockchain. Let's copy this diagram and explain precisely what a transaction is. A transaction is simply three numbers. Let's say Alice wants to transfer her coin to Bob. She will get Bob's public key. She will get a hash of the previous transaction. Now, of course, we don't have previous transaction to reference right now, but let's go with it. And then she signs it. And then Bob does the same when he wants to send to Charlie and so forth. So let's dissect this. Bob's public key is a number, remember? The hash of the previous transaction is a number and Alice's signature, what she does, she gets these two numbers, she concatenates them and she applies her private key to that. And then we have another number. When Bob wants to send to Charlie, he gets Charlie's public key. He gets the hash of the previous transaction. This means you get these three numbers, merge them all into one number and take the hash of that number and then Bob puts his signature down as the third number. Now what that hash, that second number does, it will tell people, hey, look, I am pointing towards the previous transaction. If you go to the top of that transaction, you will see my public key, use my public key, to decrypt my signature and you will see that the result is the concatenation of the first two numbers of this transaction, thereby proving that I have indeed transferred ownership of my electronic coin over to Charlie, i.e. the person who has the private key corresponding to the public key represented at the top of this transaction. If all these numbers are getting a bit much for you, let's represent everything in a pictorial format so everything is much more clearer. But wait. What if Charlie now says, okay, I'm going to try and send this same coin to both David and Emma. He could do that. How do we stop it? The easiest thing to do is to introduce a central authority, but then we just have the same scenario as with the banks and everything centralized. And we know the only way to confirm the absence of transactions is to be aware of all of the transactions. But in order to do this in a distributed setting and not relying on any third party, we're going to have to publicly announce all transactions and everybody is going to have to be aware of all of the transactions. Okay, that sounds easy, but now we need a way for everybody to agree on a single chronological order of the transactions. How do we do this? Now let's not take this lightly. The entire point of the Bitcoin network is to facilitate this. The whole point of Bitcoin is to come up with an agreed upon chronological order of the transactions in order to prevent double spending. Our solution to this problem begins with something called a timestamp server i.e. a centralized blockchain. And so how does this work? Well, we're gonna have something called a chain of hashes. We're gonna publish the hashes and somehow that's gonna prove that the data existed at the time. Okay, let's expand on this a bit more. Let me explain to you what this pretty diagram is showing us. Let's take three items that for whatever reason, we need to be able to prove that it existed at a particular date. This could be a patent or it could be some photo or just any text document. At the lowest level, of course, all of these things are just numbers. So let's represent them as their binary numbers. Now let's group them together and call this thing a block. We're going to take the hash of the previous block and then we're going to take all of these items. I'm going to add them to the hash of the previous block. I'm going to concatenate them into one big long number. We're going to then take the hash of that number and we're going to be left with a nice short 256 bit number. 
And let's just generalize and call these things items. These will soon become the transactions, but let's just stick with items for now. Now we're going to form a chain like this. And you can imagine at the end of say every day, we publish this hash and let everybody know what the hash is so that if we attempt to change one of these items, even change one bit, it's going to change the hash of the block and it's gonna have this ripple effect and it's gonna completely change the hashes of all the other blocks. This is the main idea. If we claim our item was created on a different day, then everyone call us out on our bullshit because the chain of hashes will be completely different. In the 1990s, this technology was implemented and I'll leave a link in the description to all of those that are interested in finding out more. And basically what they did is every week they would publish this so-called hash in the New York Times. That way it was available for everybody to see so they couldn't change anything and try and get away with it. But of course, because it was centralized, this one company had control over what items went in. It was trivial to know which chain was the true chain because there was only one chain. But as soon as we start to decentralize, we've run into multiple problems. We're going to have multiple chains and we don't know which chain is the right chain. We are left with complete and utter chaos. And this is where section four comes in. This is all about how do we choose the chain? Now this is the most important section of the white paper. So pay attention. In order to implement a distributed timestamp server, i.e. in order to have a decentralized blockchain, we're going to have to use something called proof of work. Here is how it works. Here is a transaction, as we have already seen. It consists of three numbers. Let's just call this for now TX. So these take the places of what we, in the last section, called items. And we're going to add two more things to this block. We're going to have the previous hash inside the block this time. And we're going to have something called a nonce. And no, this does not mean pedophile for all of you British people. A nonce stands for, I think, number used once. As I mentioned at the beginning of this video, we're going to require the hashes of the block to begin with a certain amount of zeros. So what do I mean with the hash of the block? We get each item in the block, i.e. each transaction. We can merge all of these transactions together. We're going to add that to the hash of the previous block and then we're going to add to this the nonce. We're going to start the nonce at zero and we're going to say what is the output of this hash and it's probably not going to start with the number of zeros we require. So we're just going to keep increasing the nonce and using CPU power i.e. raw energy to compute the hashes of these and remember each and every one will be completely different. It doesn't matter that the nonce is only incrementing by one so the block looks kind of similar. It's going to be completely different each and every time we change the nonce by one unit. Finally, we're going to arrive at a nonce such that when we concatenate it with the hash of the previous block and the transactions in this current block, the hash of this will begin with the required amount of zeros. So we'll take a copy of that nonce, put it in the nonce slot, and then we're going to feed the hash of this block into the next block. We're going to collect all the transactions in this block. We're going to start our nonce at zero, and we're going to repeat. That is how we're going to chain the blocks. It requires energy, physical resources to chain these blocks together. Okay, let's take a step back and see how this rule plays out in a distributed setting. That graph you see at the top there, each node of that graph, think of that as eight people. I think there's eight nodes. Eight, yep, eight nodes. Think of them as people scattered around the world on the laptop, all playing along with this game we call Bitcoin. So far, they have this chain that you've seen down below you with these green blocks. They're all going to be so-called mining the blocks, i.e. they're going to just simply be increasing the nonce of their block until they find a nonce, such that the hash of the block starts with the required amount of zeros. Let's say this fella over here is the first one to find the nonce that satisfies this requirement for his block. He will then send a message to all the people he's connected to, these three people, and say, I have come up with a new block to chain to our blockchain. And so all of these other people are going to say, OK, we are going to now try to chain another block onto your block, because the idea is the longest block is the block you work with. But let's say this guy here also finds a suitable nonce. He will then send a message to all of the people he's connected to, i.e. these four people, and say, hey, guys, I have mined a new block. And so these two people haven't seen the red block yet, so they're going to accept and they're going to start working on the blue block. But these other two blocks here, they have just received the red block prior to receiving this guy's blue block. So what they'll say is, no, I received the red block first. I will continue working on this red block. I'll keep your blue block there in case your chain gets longer. Of course, this little guy up here, he's connected to these blue guys here. So he's probably going to receive the blue block first. And so he's going to start work on that too. As you can see, we appear to be running into problems here because we haven't agreed upon which is the correct chain. Because from each of the nodes perspective, there is one singular chain. 
But from this objective point of view, this bird's eye view that we have, we can see there is not a unanimous agreement among the nodes about which is the correct block. Now before long, some node, let's say this node is going to find another block, he's going to send it out to everyone he's connected to. Those two red nodes are hopefully going to accept his block and work with that. This blue node will soon realize that he has gone down a different path, but will accept that it is longer. And so he will just simply transfer over to this red chain of here. He will then forward this on to all of the nodes he is in direct contact with, and they will do the same. And assuming that nobody else has managed to find another block within this small time delay of the nodes communicating with one another, we will have reached a unanimous agreement. As you can see, there's kind of two distinct regions of the blockchain here. We have those blocks that are old enough such that everyone agrees on the order. But then on the most recent blocks, there is some ambiguity due to different nodes claiming they have lengthened the blockchain. But then whilst one sends his message that he has extended the blockchain to the rest of the network, another node also does the same. And so some nodes are going to receive one block first and vice versa. And so we have this kind of split between order and chaos. Let's move on to section five. This tells us how to run the network in six steps. Step one, new transactions are broadcast to all nodes. So what this means, if I want to buy a car, I will have to send the transaction, that is the three numbers, to every node I am connected with, and they will then forward it onto every node they're connected with. So although it's presented as a peer-to-peer -peer payment system, really what we're doing is sending it to the entire network, and then we're kind of by this proof of work mechanism, all coming to an agreement on a chronological order, and so we don't really have to go through a third party. Step two, each node collects new transactions into a block. And so these blocks are actually listening for new transactions because they want to fill up their block so that they can start working on finding a suitable nonce. Speaking of suitable nonces, once they have enough transactions, they focus on finding the suitable nonce. When a node finds a proof of work, that is, the hash of its block starts with the required amount of zeros, it broadcasts this block to all of the nodes. So those first four steps are pretty easy, but this fifth step here, it says we have to accept the blocks only if all of the transactions are valid and not spent. I think it's worth going over exactly what this means. How do we validate a block? Okay, we have transactions in it, we have the previous hash, and we have a nonce. Apart from the obvious of checking that once we hash all of these things, we get the required amount of zeros, we also have to check that these transactions have not already been spent. How do we do this? Okay, let's take this first transaction. We get the transaction ID. And here is a representation of the blockchain we're working with. Let's say we are this red block here. And so this previous hash refers to the hash of this block here. So with this transaction ID, this is meant to tell us which block our transaction is in. And then within that block is our transaction in the first slot, the second slot, the third slot, etc. How do we find that? Well, we could go through each and every block, take the hashes of every transaction in that block and compare it to our transaction ID and see if they match. But this isn't the smartest way to go about it. The computational cost of this is big O of N, and as the blockchain scales, this will become very, very slow. Instead, every node, so let's say back in the day you had a laptop, you were using your CPU and you were a node in the Bitcoin network, what you would do is you would keep this simple database in RAM. You'd have transaction IDs and then their corresponding block number and then the transaction slot number within that block where it is to be found. Notice that I've ordered these transactions in ascending order, and so they are ordered. And how do you sort through an ordered list to find the element of interest? Interest, or we can perform a binary search. Now this is of computational cost big O of log of n. This is far, far, far faster and this scales way better than the previous naive brute force approach. So let's say after we do this, we find the block where our transaction is, we get that transaction and we get the public key from that and we attempt to decrypt this signature. We end up with a number after we apply the public key to that number and all we have to do is simply verify that the output of this is the result of concatenating the first two numbers of the transaction. If this is the case, then we have verified that this transaction is valid. We then go over to this transaction over here that we have just referenced, and we make sure to delete this out of our local transaction ID dataset we have stored in RAM. We repeat this for all transactions in the block, and if they all pass, then we have validated the block and we accept it. We express our acceptance of the block by then working on the next block in the chain using the hash of the accepted block as the previous hash. Now, what is mentioned here, we've already shown that there could be competing chains near the present moment, and then the tie will be eventually broken, and then everyone will agree on a single chain eventually. This part says, don't worry if you're not connected to every single node in the blockchain, 
because once you pass it on to everyone you're connected with, they'll pass it on to everyone they're connected with, so it exponentially runs through the network and it reaches everybody. But why would anyone bother running a node? What do they get out of it? Well, here is where section 6 comes in. Incentives. Remember when I said in section 2, where the fuck does this owner zero get his coin from? Well, it turns out that when you successfully mine a block, you are allowed to, as the first transaction in that block, simply say, I award myself a coin. This adds incentives for the nodes to support the networks, and then this is the mechanism by which coins come into circulation. This part says we could cap the maximum number of coins allowed, which is obviously has been done, 21 million, thereby having no inflation and we can transition into a network whereby the miners are incentivized with transaction fees instead. And this last part here says this incentive will help to encourage nodes to stay honest. Because if you had more CPU power than all of the honest nodes combined, you could just be honest and mine the blocks and be rewarded with bitcoins. Moving on to section 7, or should I say 7 and 8, these two sections are very, very, very closely related. The technology in section 7 allows for something called simplified payment verification, or SPV, and these would not be possible without section 7 here. So SPV allows us to verify payments without running a full node on the network, which as I briefly mentioned earlier, is extremely important for the sustainability of the Bitcoin network. If we run a small barbershop or whatever, we need to be able to have access to the network Network to ensure that we have been paid. Now, Vitalik Buterin himself, in the Ethereum white paper, as an aside, subscribe if you want to have this kind of similar video, but for the Ethereum white paper instead. I plan to do that video very, very, very soon. The Ethereum white paper mentions these two sections and mentions just how important they are. Let's take a closer look at section 7. So basically, we're in this situation. We can discard all of the transactions that have already been spent because we only need to know the latest transaction in any coin. So to illustrate this, let's take our blockchain. We have this kind of certain region and uncertain region. Remember that every coin is created in the first transaction slot in every new block. So let's say a coin was created in this block and was rewarded to whoever mined this block. Let's say this guy then sent this coin to somebody else in this block and the same happened in this block and this block and this block. So this creation block here will just have the successful miners public key in it. This second block, will look something like this, where this hash will refer to the hash of this transaction, or in this case, just the hash of the public key. And then we will use that public key in this transaction in order to decrypt the signature in the most recent transaction, thereby verifying that the owner of the coin has given permission to transfer the coin. Now, this is the process of transacting. And this is the chain of digital signatures that define the coin. As you can see, it gets a bit confusing because this chain exists within the blockchain and it's kind of implicit, it's not stored anywhere. But anyway, as you can see, this public key with an E stamped on it is the most recent transaction. Therefore, Edward is the owner of this coin and all of the previous transactions can actually be disregarded because we won't actually ever have to refer to them. But then, as we saw in section three, if we change, or in this case, remove a transaction from the block, the hash of the block is going to change. And so this will have a ripple effect and break the entire chain of hashes. So the question is, can we delete transactions whilst not breaking the chain of hashes? The answer is yes. And in order to do this, we're going to have to hash the transactions into something called a Merkle tree. And so we have a nice diagram to look at again. And we have this down here, which feel free to read. It just says how great it'll be and how much memory we will save. Okay, so let's just take a step back here. Here's what we have so far. Let's call these transactions 0, 2, 3 to just show that they are actually different transactions. We have a chain of them. Here's the problem. If we delete one, then this changes the hash of the block. And so this has the ripple effect and it fucks up the entire chain. And all of our security is completely gone because all of the proof of works are completely messed up. So here's what we're going to do instead. We're just going to have this thing called a block header. And this block header is going to include the hash of the previous block header, the root, something called the root hash, as well as the nonce. So what is this root hash? Okay, so what we do, we get each of our transactions and we take their hashes. And then for each pair, we can catenate them and then take another hash. And we keep doing this until eventually we will concatenate two numbers, take the hash, 
and we will have no more pairs left and we will call this the root hash and we will include this within the block header. So let's just be clear about what's going on here. Everything with a green box around it is what we have stored in our memory. All of these red things are not stored because if we have these green boxes, we can simply calculate the red ones. Of course, everything in the block header is always stored. That is permanently in our memory. Let's say we no longer need to ever reference transaction one here ever again. What we could do is simply, instead of storing the transaction, we could store the hash of the transaction. And notice that we can still reproduce the root hash from everything we have stored in these green boxes. Similarly, if we never have to reference transaction zero, we can delete that and simply store the hash of transaction zero. But then at that point, why are we storing both the hash of the first transaction and the hash of the, well, the zeroth and the first transaction? We could simply get rid of both of them and just store the hash of the result of concatenating these two hashes. Yes, and I'm aware this gets really, really confusing, but it's really, take if you pause the video and really go through it, you'll find it's quite simple. So we can do the same with transaction number two. Two. Now, let me just give a quick example here. If somebody says, hi, can I have proof that transaction three was included in this block at the time of creation? Then we can say, sure, no problem. Take this number, take this number, get your transaction, hash that transaction to get this number, concatenate it with this number, and then take the hash to get this number, and then concatenate these two numbers and take the hash again. You will be left with the root hash. So then the guy goes, okay, I am satisfied that this transaction was part of this block at the time of the creation of this block. Why is he satisfied? Because the probability that I am able to give these random numbers in that order to be able to be used with the transaction in order to give the root hash is one in two to the power of 256, i.e. zero. Now for illustrative purposes, I've only included four transactions in each block here. Usually we have between one and 2,000 transactions in a block. And so at that scale, you can really start to see why this is such a powerful tool in terms of saving disk space. So now we can see different people running their nodes have these different types of blockchains. They all have the same block header, but then some people choose to, as they go along, remove transactions they no longer need. As you can see, the ones that are closest to the most present block may look like a full block because those transactions haven't yet been spent. Whereas blocks from a while back could have literally every transaction no longer ever being needed to be referred to. And so it can simply store the block header. So we have these big brain folks here that know everything. These medium sized brain folks here, they know quite a bit. And then we have these peanut sized brain people. They just keep a copy of the block header. So these people who merely keep a copy of the block header can ask for a proof that a transaction has been accepted. These people here can mine blocks as well as independently verifying that a transaction has been accepted. And then these people, they are omniscient. They know absolutely everything that's ever happened in the Bitcoin blockchain. They can trace any coin to the origin and any new node that joins the network has to ask these people for the entire history so that they can work through the entire history themselves to verify every transaction. So these peanut sized brain people, they're actually the ones who run the SPV nodes. So let's walk through an example of some car shop running an SPV node. And then this guy comes up to them and says, hey, can I buy a car? This guy says, yeah, sure. He says, can I buy in Bitcoin? He says, yeah, sure. He says, okay, I just sent the transaction. And this car, the car owner is going to wait until he can get verification or a proof that this transaction, which sends this customer's coin over to him, is indeed valid and has been accepted by the network. So he says to either the medium sized brain nodes or these big omniscient brain nodes, hey guys, send me a proof that my transaction has been included. Some guy replies, he says, yeah, here's your transaction, right? He says, yes, that is my transaction. So then he says, okay, so if you just go and hash that, you'll get his number. And he goes, yes, I'll get a number. If you concatenate it with this one and then hash it, you will get this number. Concatenate it with this one and then hash it and you'll get the root hash. You know the chain of block headers, so you know what the root hash is. And I have just given you what is called a Merkle proof. That your transaction was indeed included within this block at the time of creation. And so the guy running the SPV node, the peanut sized brain node, can see, okay, lots of blocks have been mined on top of this, which means it's extremely likely to be a valid transaction as basically the entire network has accepted it as valid. So I am happy. 
Up until now, we have been transferring a single electronic coin, but that is a piss take. And it gives us yet another pretty diagram, which doesn't really tell us a lot. But basically, we can have multiple inputs and always have two outputs. The first output is sent to the receiver, and then the second output, we're going to send change back to ourselves. So as far as the Bitcoin network is concerned, we're actually sending coins to ourselves here, which of course is actually valid. And there's no need to worry about all these transactions getting all complicated and fast and out everywhere because value is conserved. In each transaction, if you count the value of all the inputs, they will equal that of the outputs. Okay, so our transactions so far have just been these three numbers. I'm going to slightly rearrange this transaction here and we're going to allow for multiple inputs. That is multiple transaction IDs which refer to different coins. And then we're going to have two public keys. One is going to be the guy we're sending it to and then we're going to have our own public key to send ourselves any leftover change. What's this signature here? It's the same as before. We simply just use our private key to sign it. Okay, let's turn to pictures because they're always easier to work with. Any keys with the silver the metal bit, they're ours, and any keys with the gold bits, they're somebody else's. Let's give these transaction IDs different shades of pink just to highlight that they are actually different. And this is our signature down here. Now let's say we wanted to send 20 electronic coins to somebody. We have at our disposal previous transactions in the Bitcoin blockchain sending us 11, 8, and 4 coins to our public key. As you can see, we can't just have the first two inputs because that would only add up to 19. And the rule is we have to use the entire value of the transaction output. So we have to include these entire four coins in this transaction. That, of course, adds up to 23. So we're going to send three coins back to ourselves. So let's just make this clearer with an illustration of our blockchain once again. Remember that we have this tran this local transaction ID database stored in our RAM. And so we can use these three transaction IDs and look up where they exist in the blockchain. And so let's say after we found them, we go to each individual one. We say, this is the output I am referring to. I claim this is my public key. But of course, because there's two outputs, what we really need in our inputs is not only the transaction ID, but the index of the output within that transaction that we are referring to. Now, of course, this gets confusing because we have a blockchain, which is composed of blocks, which is composed of transactions. And then those transactions are composed of transaction inputs, which are composed of transaction IDs and indexes, as well as transaction outputs and a signature. And this could get even more complicated because we can actually have multi-signature transactions. But this paper does not mention anything about that. If you want to find out more about multi-signature transactions and how they made Bitcoin's Lightning Network possible, then you know what to do. Subscribe. Subscribe. Okay, so this is our public key. We claim we have the private key to. And so now we just check that we can indeed decrypt the signature with this public key, which proves that we were the owners of the previous 11 coins. And so this transaction is valid. And so we are allowed to include this transaction input in our transaction. So of course we'll delete this transaction ID out of our database. Well, not exactly because a transaction now has two outputs. And so what we really need is both the transaction ID as well as the index indicating whether it is the first or second or zeroth or first output in the transaction. So we'll actually have two entries for each transaction ID in here. Nevertheless, we delete the output, the transaction output that we have just used up, and we do the same for each of the other ones. And hopefully they all correspond to the public key, which is able to decrypt that digital signature and everything goes swimmingly and it's accepted. If this is getting a bit confusing to understand, imagine you go into a store and the cashier says that is $1.55, please. And you have in your pocket a $1 note and then you have 50 cent and 10 cent coin. What will happen? You can't just say, oh, I'll split that 10 cent coin in half and give you 5 cents. Nope. No, no, no. You send over all of it and then the cashier takes 155 and gives you change of 5 cents. And so that's how it works in Bitcoin. Now time for a super short section 10. This is all about privacy, but this section is obsolete and I'll tell you why. Okay, so here it says all the transactions are public. They're all on a public decentralized ledger, but it's okay because all of our identities are tied to our public keys. So we don't give our real world identities away. So it's all good. Contrast this with the legacy financial system where we get our privacy, but at the cost of not having an absolute clue what is going on because everything is so opaque. But remember that this white paper 
paper was written before we had exchanges like Coinbase. So nowadays, if we want to gain access to coins, what we'll do is transfer money from our bank to an exchange. And then if we actually control our own keys, we will send it to our public key or Bitcoin address, which is very similar to a public key. But in this video, I'm trying to keep to the white paper as much as possible. So in the early days, you could just get your laptop, use your CPU and mine coins directly. But of course, that is far too expensive now. And so we really don't have any privacy in the Bitcoin network. Now on to section 11. In it, Satoshi simulates an attack on the Bitcoin network, but he does so with somebody with less than 50% of CPU power. So we kind of already agree if he has more than 50% CPU power, we're fucked. If he has less than 50, does it mean he cannot attack the network? Well, no, that doesn't have to be the case. Just think of an extreme example where we are super, super, super lucky and we only have to try a few nonces in order that our block has a hash which starts with a suitable number of zeros. We will just keep winning and winning and mining all the blocks. But what does he actually mean by attack? Well, here is our blockchain. And let's say we bought our car at this block here. The guy who sold us the car is going to say, I want to wait for a bit to make sure that the transaction is valid and has gone through and exists in the blockchain. So we could say, okay, yep, fair enough. We can wait. But then what we could do is simply go to a block before that transaction occurred and then just mine our own blocks, which includes all of the valid transactions that were included in these other blocks, except one specific transaction. Transaction. That transaction being a transaction whereby we sent him the bitcoins from our address to his address or our public key to his public key. So this becomes a race because obviously the main blockchain is still going to be adding blocks whilst we're trying to catch up. But notice that if we do catch up at any point, then we will send proof that we have a valid chain which is longer than everyone else's and all of the other nodes are just going to accept, okay, this is the best, the longest chain which has the most work invested in it. And so I'm not actually going to go through this section because it's purely just a standard textbook probability example and I'm not going to explain to everyone what a Poisson distribution is or the gambler's ruin problem. If you have studied any stats or probability in a university or in a American college level, you will be able to understand this section pretty easily. And it's not really a blockchain specific section here. It's, it's actually just a probability question. It is worth pointing out some of these results. So this Q here, this refers to the proportion of hashing power, i.e. the CPU power that an attacker has. So let's say he has 10%. Then what he's saying is, if we wait for the transaction to be in zero confirmed blocks, then he can obviously attack us and reclaim the money because he could just send us absolutely anything because no nodes have confirmed it. If we wait for our transaction to be included in one block, then he has a 20.5% chance of attacking us and reclaiming his money back. If we wait for, and this is industry standard, if we wait for our transaction to be included in a block, which is six blocks deep into the Bitcoin network, then the chances of him attacking the network is pretty much non-existent. If he had 30% of the hashing power of the network, we can see how it compares. If it's five blocks deep, there's still a 17.7% chance he can attack. If it's 10 blocks deep, it's 4.2%, etc, etc, etc. And finally, the shortest section in the history of sections. The conclusion, it basically says, here's what we've done. And feel free to read that yourself because all he does is tell you what he's done. If you are listening to me now, that means you have watched the entire video, which probably means you are interested in learning lots more about blockchain. And so in that case, I would highly recommend you subscribe to this channel. Have a great day. Maybe that was just a dream